Hey, all you podcast listeners out there in podcast world. <laughs> hey, cool cats. This is Zach Horton coming to you across the airwaves. Oh, dear. With our scripture study project podcast. Hey, you got to do a fun one last week. Just trying it out. Oh, but you laughed at me every time and made me feel really dumb. Well, you're laughing at me. So. Well, you're trying to be dumb. I was actually like, trying to be normal. <laughs> No, I always did want a career in, I always thought I'd be good at doing a, a career in radio, because I like to talk. Because he had a smooth voice or something. Because I have a smooth voice. <laughs> hey, welcome to the Scripture Study Project, our podcast that gives you a fresh and faithful study of the scriptures that we hope will renew your excitement for your own personal study and help you passionately teach what you're learning to others. I am the sultry voice of the Scripture Study Project, Zach, and this is my... What am I? Sultry wife. That just made That's our. Bad. That just made it a PG thirteen podcast. <laughs> but uh, we are really excited. Um, this is going to be our last episode for two weeks. We're taking a week off next week for general conference. Um, so spend your podcast time next week listening to or revisiting general conference. Um, we've got a study tip to gear you up for general conference that we're excited about. And our study day is actually really, really unique and kind of fun as well. So a lot of good things in this episode. Yeah, that study tip today is just all about conference. We just wanted to talk about, I mean, I think that's what's on our mind is how can we prepare for conference? Um, we get really excited for general conference and, so I think we just wanted to maybe share some ideas, and I think actually I'm going to maybe tag a few people on our Instagram too this week, um, just to share and give ideas. We'd love to hear yours as well. If you have some, we'd love to yes. kind of make that a thing. I just, it's just so fun. It like is fun. My kids, my kids honestly love General Conference, and I think it's, well, we, we do kind of give them things yeah. over. <laughs> but anyway... So we just wanted to talk a little about General Conference. As I was thinking about it, a thought that came to mind was when we did King Benjamin's address, we mentioned that when the people gathered to hear him, they gathered in their families, in their tents, with their tents pointed towards King Benjamin, so they could listen to his words while they were together with their families. And I love that symbol, and it reminds me, we were just talking to our kids tonight about how blessed they are to be able to listen to General Conference or watch General Conference at home. Um, when we were serving our mission, they had to, if ward members wanted to watch General Conference, you had to go to the church, um, and it would be broadcast over satellite. And even that was a blessing because years before that, you had to wait in foreign countries, you had to wait for the General Conference videotape to arrive before you could view it. So it was, you know, weeks after. And, and so it's this really neat thing where we get to listen. And I think the power of General Conference comes when we gather together with those that we love. Um, in our homes, and we point our tents or point our hearts towards the words of the prophets. And so what we've got for our study tip today is just a, a smattering of ideas that we've used with our kids to help make General Conference into a really sacred weekend. Um, we've, When we first started doing these, we thought General Conference should be like a holiday. It should feel like a holiday. And today, um, in a... But it does, I think... Does it, it is a holiday? Well, it does. But but today, um, our bishop mentioned that he he um, tries to make it that that general conference is a very sacred weekend. And I thought ah, that's that's really what it is. It's not that it's a holiday; yeah. it's that it's a sacred weekend. It's a holy weekend, not a holiday, but a holy day or a holy weekend. And so, so a couple of things, ideas that we have that we use, and and some references to others that might help you get ready for general conference. Well, yeah, the first one. I mean. I think I just get more inspired again. I know a, a few people that do like the 30 days leading up to general conference. They'll listen to a talk each day, which I think is really cool. Um, for me, I just, I've been kind of reviewing the talks mm -hmm. over the last week or two and want to keep doing that. I think that's awesome to do as well. Um, um, we, some things that we love to do with our kids. I, you were talking about King Benjamin. I've heard of people that actually get up tents for general Come conference, and then up. they'll watch it under the TV, which I think is really fun. Um, there's so many, so many fun ideas. And I think, I guess I like that idea of like the holiday versus the sacred weekend, because 
my kids are kind of getting a little crazy about general conference now. Like they were tonight, they were like, and then mom, you can put us on a treasure hunt. And then every time someone talks and you can do this. And I'm thinking, okay, those are really good ideas and we'll consider them. But I also like want them to remember why we're really listening. Uh-huh. So anyway, some of the ideas, I got this from my friend Jesse, who um, runs Miss Genealogy on Instagram. She each each time a speaker talks, the kids get a bag of activities, and that's like a small activity or a treat. Um, and my kids love that one. And, and I think that one's fun. It engages them with who the speaker is. And it um, helps them. The activities are always geared to something they can listen while they're doing something. And so yeah. it, it really it keeps them in that's the That's been kind of our staple, I think, mm-hmm. over the past few years as our kids have grown. And that one's just, just really fun. I'm going to link up to hers because she actually has it on her Instagram page, some ideas. Um, One that we did a couple of years ago, I think we've done a couple of times, is giving them little conference notebooks, either just a plain notebook you buy from the store or printing mm-hmm. off one that the church produces, which I think we'll do this year. Um, they are something special when they get to take notes, when they get to draw pictures, when they get a... One year we pulled out all old friend magazines and new and Enzyme magazines, and they got to cut out pictures of things that they were listening to or liking. And, and that was just a fun way for them to kind of engage and to search the words of prophets and apostles as they were listening to them. And certainly I think we feel like, yeah, we, we have our kids are eight and under and we have four kids. And certainly I think we feel like, oh, we didn't get to listen quite as much as we want to. But I, I really think when you're putting a little extra pre- preparation in for your kids too, I think you, you can get a lot more out of it. So anyway, we'll be tagging a few more resources that are really fun on our Instagram this week. Um, just to share some of that general conference excitement. I don't know if it's so much what you do as it is that you do something. There's a power that comes in oh, preparing to hear, amen. Uh, hear church yeah. leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, and so whatever it is that you do using these resources, maybe you've got some other ones that we would love to hear. We're always looking for new and fun ideas. Uh, but whatever whatever you do, do something. Do something to prepare yourself and prepare your family to hear prophets. So, Okay. Um, have you said what we're studying? Third Nephi? I don't think Third, you said it. No. Third Nephi 20 through 25. We want to start with this verse in chapter 20. The Savior uses a couple of words to describe himself. And I love these words. So this is chapter 20, verse 10. It came to pass that when they had all given glory unto Jesus, he said unto them, Behold, now I finish the commandment which the Father hath commanded me concerning this people, who are remnant of the house of Israel. Yea, remember that I spake unto you and said that when the words of Isaiah should be fulfilled, behold, they are written, ye have them here before you, therefore search them. And verily, verily, I say unto you that when they shall be fulfilled, then is the fulfilling of the covenant which the Father hath made unto his people, O house of Israel. Over the next couple of chapters, the Savior is going to talk a lot about that idea that he has come to finish the work that the Father has given him and to fulfill the covenant of the Father. And I like that idea. Oh, I don't I like that idea. I love that idea. I don't know why I'm so fascinated with it, but I love that one of the character traits of Jesus is that he is a, f- a finisher. He's a fulfiller, that he doesn't ever promise anything without delivering on that promise. And maybe I like it because we mentioned this last episode, but the word faith, uh, the Greek root of faith connotes confidence. Uh, It's a similar word used when you have an interaction with someone, a business interaction, and you give them collateral to prove your trustworthiness. It's a similar idea with the way the Greek text uses faith in that um, I can have confidence in someone. And so maybe I love that idea because it to me, it means I can have confidence in Jesus because he will fulfill and does fulfill and has fulfilled every little tiny promise that has ever been made by God anywhere, at any time. He finishes it and he fulfills it. And don't you think that's why, I mean, for me, I just think of those words and think of the prophecies from the Old Testament and then the New Testament and the way he teaches and talks about his his role as the fulfiller. I mean, that's a great faith builder. That's mm-hmm. a great, a great, I don't know, it's so fun to read those parts of scripture because it does sustain that faith and hope that you have mm-hmm. in 
in him, in God. So what we want to do is just name a couple of things. Again, your study will be much more in-depth than this. But a couple of things we found in these chapters where Jesus is fulfilling a promise or talks about a promise that he will fulfill that can increase our confidence and our trust in him. And so the first one that I found is the very next verse uh, after verse 12 that we read is verse 13. And then, meaning after the Father has, or after Jesus has begun to fulfill the words of Isaiah and finish the work the Father has given him, Verse 13, and then shall the remnants which shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth be gathered in from the east and from the west and from the south and from the north, and they shall be brought to the knowledge of the Lord their God who hath redeemed them. And so the first thing that Jesus mentions that he will fulfill is to gather scattered Israel. Now, of course, there's a global view of this. And if you want to go back and and listen to our episode on Jacob 5, we talked about the global view of this, that there is a scattering of Israel to which missionaries play a part, and there's a a global event. But I think there's a much more personal meaning to the gathering of Israel in that Jesus will be actively involved in reaching out and grabbing those who are estranged from him and bringing them back to him. Short of violating agency, he will do everything within his power to fulfill his promise to gather scattered Israel. Um, I've, I've often thought that we often don't give Jesus enough credit for the power that he has. We put far too much stress on our own shoulders and far too little faith and confidence in him in that when we make a mistake, we think that we're hopeless. Or when our children make mistakes, we stress about it when we worry about it. And we forget that there's a Jesus in charge who is all-powerful and all-knowing, and his sole desire is to bring us back to him. And he's pretty good at getting what he wants. And so I love this idea that Jesus gathers scattered Israel. Um, I have had a couple of stories, recent experiences, not mine, but other people's, um, where I have seen people that have been estranged from the church um, for years, sometimes decades at a time, and who then are brought back to the church through sometimes miraculous, and in one case, a, a devastating way that something happens that just shakes the very earth on which these individuals stand, and then they come back. And it's proof to me that there's a God out there trying to reach to him and grab him. I get parents all the time that come into my office that that are stressed or, or call that are stressed about their children who don't want to go to church anymore or, or who don't want to go to seminary anymore or who they feel are losing their testimony. And I can't imagine, I can't empathize with that. My children are little. And so they fight over each other on who gets to answer the question we ask for scripture study. So I know I don't have teenagers yet. I don't have that stress. But one of the thoughts I often share is, Remember that before they were your children, they were his children. And as much as you want them back, he wants them more. And sometimes I think there's there's a little bit of patience that we can have, a little bit of confidence in a God that wants to gather, that his sole desire is to fulfill his promise to gather scattered Israel. And yeah, I know, I think not only of his, you know, that patience that you mentioned, but also just that that greater perspective he mm-hmm. has of who we are and and who our our children are not that like you said not that it's easy to yeah. to actually live through or to to be having those as a worries as a parent but but to know that he sees israel whether that's you or your children or your family he mm-hmm. sees israel as they were as they are and as they are to be all things are present before him so yeah he's looking at a rebellious teenager right now and and mourning with you and feeling sad But at the same time, he's also looking at that rebellious teenager at age 25 when he finally decides to serve a mission. And he's looking at that rebellious teenager at age 30 when he's now married to a a beautiful woman and has a child. And he's looking at that that rebellious teenager at age 55 when he's a grandpa and he's a a state patriarch. He sees all things in front of him. And so the fact that he gathers scattered Israel, I, I went to this scripture because I love it. This is in the Old Testament. And I don't want to cheat too much and steal from our Old Testament podcast, but this is verse 14 in Jeremiah chapter 16. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the lands whither he had driven them. 
and I will bring them again into the land that I gave their fathers. In other words, there will come a day when the miracle that people most talk about isn't that God parted the Red Sea and brought the children of Israel through and saved them. It's that God saved my family member, that God gathered scattered Israel and brought them back to the land of their inheritance. He brought them home. That's the miracle. That's the promise that Jesus is fulfilling. And I just, I love that about him. It really increases my faith and my confidence in him. If you skip a few verses down here, the one I found that just stuck out to me was um, in thir- in chapter 20, verses 23, starting in 23. Behold, I am he of whom Moses spake, saying, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul who will not hear the, that prophet shall be cut off from among the people. Verily I say unto you, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have testified of me. Um, when we talk about fulfilling, that's exactly what he's talking about in these verses. Um, I love hearing that he's bearing witness that all of these prophets in the Old Testament have been bearing witness of who he was and what he would do. And here he is saying, I fulfilled that. Here I am. What they said really did happen. Um, And so you think of that. And I think, I mean, ultimately, that's one of the many reasons that I love reading the scriptures. I love reading about what the prophets say about Jesus Christ. I love the prophecies that he's going to come and what he's going to do because we see that fulfilled. Um, And likewise, it helps us to prepare for knowing that he's going to come again because that's what our prophets today are telling us. Mm -hmm. I love the thought. um, I just, I'm just love prophets. I'm so grateful for prophets today too that help us that they're doing the same thing that these prophets were doing in the scriptures. They're mm-hmm. testifying of that Christ is going to come again. So I love reading these things because it's so fun to think and so faith promoting for me to think, hey, it happened. It's going to happen again. And kind of to put yourself in the shoes of, of what these guys are feeling in these chapters of this is really him. He came. We've been waiting and waiting. I, don't, I haven't thought of that, but that emotion that they would have of back in 3 Nephi 11 when we read that, they came to him and, and witnessed that it was he of whom the prophets had testified that should come. And we've mm-hmm. been waiting for thousands of years that prophets have been prophesying that Jesus would come. They never said the the time or when he would come. And here he finally is. And to think of what will we feel when he comes again, the the relief and the, and hopefully the gladness we will have at having trusted and and been patient enough to wait for his second coming and and to be excited about that. And even more so excitement for general conference in that. I think, you know, that's one of those things you get so excited because it's, what are they going to say and how, what's it going to be like? You know, it works for me. I love, I love the teachings of prophets because it, it, they testify of Christ, which always increases my confidence in him, but they also give such practical words of God that for me have been, have been right on the money every conference the things that they teach about family, the things they teach about personal growth and faith and living a life of simplicity and peace and and service. I, I just, yeah, we could geek out about this all day. Well, and what I do want to say, and I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but in chapter um, 23, um, he talks about, this is Jesus basically telling them to keep reading the scriptures. He's quoting Isaiah and he's talking about how important. And so I, I also kind of love that too, because it's another plug for Isaiah rocks, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but also that he's not saying like, okay, I fulfilled it. We're done with the old Testament, but I think he's telling us to continue to read the words of those prophets because it helps. I hope I'm going to say this right. It helps us see what it looks like when he fulfills his Mm -hmm. promise. He fulfilled that promise of coming and he's going to again. And we can feel that as we watch people prepare and testify of him in the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. Th- uh, another one that I found in chapter 21 that kind of goes along with what you were saying is it's kind of a, a negative couple of verses. Um, these are promises that um, are kind of harsh when they when they get fulfilled. But there's a reason behind them. So, verse 14, Yea, woe be unto the Gentiles, except they repent. 
For it shall come to pass in that day, meaning in our day, saith the Father, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots, and I will cut off the cities of thy land, and throw down all thy strongholds, and I will cut off witchcrafts out of thy land, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images will I also cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the works of thy hands. I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. And it shall come to pass that all lyings and deceivings and envyings and strifes and priestcrafts and whoredoms shall be done away. Now that sounds kind of scary. Uh, it's a good thing because it's God getting rid of um, of corruption and wickedness from the earth. Um, but the thing I like about it is what he's the reason why he's doing that. The reason why he's keeping this promise in chapter in verse twenty five, and then shall the power of heaven come down among them, and I also will be in their midst. He's preparing for his coming. He's cleansing the world to prepare for the second coming. A lot of times I know we view the destruction at the second coming with fear and apprehension, but if we view it in a way that that Jesus is preparing the world for a millennial reign where there's peace and prosperity, then it makes a lot more sense. Now, again, that's a global view. The personal view that I like is, well, I like and sometimes don't like, is I think he does the same thing with us. I think that one of the promises Jesus fulfills with us as individuals is he destroys from us some of our more wicked and base tendencies, that he takes an active role in trying to drive those out of our personality. Unfortunately for us, sometimes the way that he drives those out isn't pleasant. The way you get rid of a disease or a rotten tooth is not a fun experience. And so it hurts and it stings when he cleanses us. But he's cleansing us, purifying us, so that, in verse 25, that the power of heaven will come down and so that he can be with us. Yeah, I was going to say, it's kind of... It is painful, like that feeling of getting rid of those things. But it's also really cool to mm-hmm. think that he cares about us enough to do that. In we're not going to get into these chapters because they're all Old Testament ones. Chapters 24 and 25, he's quoting the last two chapters of Malachi. And so we'll hold on those until we get there. But I will tease this one idea that one of the guiding theories in those chapters is, we always jump to the verses on tithing or on family history. But the reason why he's talking about tithing and family history in Malachi is because those are the methods by which God is going to help reclaim us at the last day. Those chapters, if you read them carefully, they're all about purifying and cleansing us. And I love the idea that as painful as it is to me sometimes that one of the promises Jesus is going to fulfill is he's going to take an active role in my life in purging me of of wickedness and of evil and of of temptations. Yeah, which is exactly like you said, sometimes that's so hard, but sometimes it's so wonderful and awesome to think that he's really going to help us with those things. So the question that we came up with at the end of all these promises is, well, those are what he's going to do to fulfill his promises, his side of the covenant. What do we have to do to prepare for that? Yeah, because I was going to say, you said it just barely, but All throughout, you know, we're talking about what he does to fulfill and finish, but all throughout these chapters is covenant, the covenant, Mm. the covenant. And we know that we're part of that covenant too. So what what are we going to do? Well, in chapter 21, the the whole chapter is is given as a sign for when these promises will begin to be fulfilled. And without going and reading every verse, it's pretty quick to see... Verse 1, he says, I will show you a sign that you may know when the time of these things shall happen. Verse 2, behold, this is the thing which I will give unto you for a sign. For verily I say unto you that when these things, meaning the things that are being written about what he's saying right now, hence the Book of Mormon, when these things which I declare unto you and which I shall declare unto you hereafter of myself and by the power of the Holy Ghost, which shall be given unto you the Father, shall be made known unto the Gentiles that they may know concerning this people who are a remnant of the house of Jacob. And he goes on and on. But when these things are given to the Gentiles, and then in verse 7, when these things that are given to the Gentiles are then given back to your seed, the descendants of, of Nephites and Lamanites, that will be a sign that 
these things have begun, that, that the Father is commencing his work and that Jesus is involved. And so to make a long story short, when the Book of Mormon comes forth and is preached on all nations, that's the sign that we're doing the work of the last days. And here we are, the Book of Mormon is translated and being preached and taught everywhere. So what's our responsibility then with that book or with those scriptures that are the sign of his of his impending coming? And yeah, this brings us back to chapter 23 that I referenced earlier. He says, verse 1, And now behold, I say unto you that ye ought to search these things. Yea, a commandment I give unto you that ye search these things diligently. For great are the words of Isaiah. For surely he spake as touching all things concerning my people, which are the house of Israel. Therefore it must needs be that he must speak also to the Gentiles. And all things that he spake have been and shall be even according to the words which he spake. Therefore give heed to my words, write the things which I have told you, and according to the time and the will of the Father they shall go forth unto the Gentiles. And whosoever will hearken unto my words, and repenteth and is baptized, the same shall be saved. Search the prophets, for many there be that testify of these things. That's cool. I kind of got chills a little bit, just that last prophecy, many there be that testify of these things that will mm-hmm. talk about what the world is going to look like at the last days and the promises that Jesus will fulfill. I know I've said this a lot, but this episode, but amen to yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> I need to think of a different way to say that, but I, I just, yeah, it, this really is ended up being the perfect episode before general conference. Mm-hmm. As we look to our latter day prophets who help to, um, guide us and show us what the Savior's doing in preparation for his second coming. To fulfill and how we can fulfill our side of that. Thanks for helping me on that thought. (laughs) Well, to finish, this is chapter 21, a little bit uh, close to the end of the chapter, verses 26 through 28. Then shall the work of the Father commence at that day, even when this gospel shall be preached among the remnant of this people. Verily I say unto you, at that day shall the work of the Father commence among all the dispersed of my people, yea, even the tribes which have been lost, which the Father hath led away out of Jerusalem. Yea, the work shall commence among all the dispersed of my people with the Father to prepare the way whereby they may come unto me, that they may call on the Father in my name. And then here's the verse that I love. Yea, and then shall the work commence which the Father among all, with the Father among all nations in preparing the way whereby his people may be gathered home to the land of their inheritance. And one way to view these chapters or this portion of the Savior's sermon is it's all about how he's going to get us home. That's his desire. That's the desire behind gathering. That's the desire behind prophets. That's the, the desire behind scripture study is he just wants to bring us home. He's promised that he will do it, and he's going to deliver on that promise. He's going to do it with us. He's going to do it with our children. He's going to do it with our family members. Um, he's, he's going to do it. And I think there's a lot of faith that we can have and confidence in that. So thank you so much. Thanks for studying with us. Thanks for listening. Enjoy General Conference. We'll see you in two weeks. Remember, we're going to take next week off um, from our new episode, but we will be back October 15th. Yeah, 14th or 15th. So enjoy General Conference, and we hope you have a wonderful week.